Uh, it's, a, it's a great pleasure to uh, speak for all the Southern Californian people. I've been in your midst for uh, quite a while now, but I'll, I'm still looking forward to, uh, to meeting you all uh, in person, hopefully soon. <clears throat> um, this talk is going to be like uh, the previous uh, talks uh, about 3D uh, gravity. Um, so uh, good job on part of the organizers there for, uh, for putting these talks together, I would say. I've definitely learned a lot already from the previous talks. Um, I should say though, the approach we will take is quite complementary to, to that of the previous talks. Um, we'll one, well, I'll, I'll go into this a bit more in a bit more detail, but we will be, not be calculating path integrals and stuff. So it'll be a bit more <clears throat> down to earth, starting from classical gravity and, and building our way up from there. Um, because the main part of the talk is also quite down to earth, uh, potentially the introduction that I'll start with um, might be the most abstract uh, uh, abstract part, but uh, hopefully you'll allow me the, uh, to put together the motivations that uh, we had for uh, considering this problem. Uh, I should also say this, so this is uh, ba uh, based on published work uh, of about a month ago with uh, Per Kraus, whom you all know, and Richard Myers, who is uh, here as well, who is a third year grad student at uh, UCLA. <clears throat> Um, okay, so, so let me start with a brief introduction and motivation, um, picking some uh, elements in the recent and not so recent literature um, that you know, can give inspiration for the problem we're about to tackle. And the, one of the basic observations is that in the gravitational theories that we know and love, uh, the observables we can calculate uh, tend to be asymptotic. And so I'm just giving two you know, well, very well-known examples, which are S-matrix amplitudes and string theory or conformal field theory um, correlation functions and ADS-CFT. And so it seems like a natural question to ask whether or not we can you know, calculate in the principle uh, more local observables. Um, and that's one of the things we'll have in the back of our mind in this, uh, in this project. Um, I should mention maybe uh, at any point in the talk, feel free like, like before to ask questions. Um, uh, and, and just interrupt me. Um, so, so this question about more local observables is not a new one. It's been addressed uh, in, in a lot of, uh, you know, in a lot of papers in the last two decades. I didn't want to make a list on this slide because I feel like any list would necessarily be incomplete, but um, people who have been working on this uh, probably have a number of things in mind, such as, for example, um, the construction of bulk operators from the, from the CFT ones. Um, potentially state dependent or operators behind horizons or black holes, et cetera. Um, there's a uh, very rich literature on how entanglement entropy in the CFT is geometrically encoded in the bulk, et cetera. How, uh, you know, quantum error correction comes in uh, through this, how potentially within entanglement wedges one can reconstruct, uh, you know, the bulk, et cetera. Uh, people have constructed, you know, dressed operators, gravitationally dressed operators. Uh, Etc. So um, this is definitely not a new. We're definitely not the first ones to answer to ask this question, but hopefully we can provide a new perspective. And the sort of route we will take um, to simplify the problem is to go to low numbers of dimensions. So um, this is again something that people have done many times in the past. Uh, and I'm I'm just picking out one here, uh, one particular one here, because I I stole this figure or I borrowed this figure from a particular paper by Stanford and Yang, uh, which, which turned out together with this other paper, uh, they, they managed to, uh, in, in two-dimensional gravity, in Jackie's tidal bottom gravity, managed to actually calculate from the gravitational point of view, path integrals um, of uh, boundaries with fixed length. And that's sort of the image I, I think is very useful to have in mind also for this talk. Um, but then instead of two-dimensional gravity, we will actually try to um, make some progress uh, in three-dimensional gravity um, and uh, in, in this particular sort of setup or, or in a very similar setup. Now, three-dimensional gravity is obviously, uh, well, it's, it's more complicated, but still shares uh, the, the nice property that it has no local degrees of freedom, at least in pure gravity. Uh, but a very uh, important independent motivation or independent um, um, piece of knowledge in the literature is its proposed uh, relation with the so-called TT bar operator. 
Um, so as I will explain now, uh, there's a, a thing called the TT bar operator in, in quantum field theories or in the CFT, so in the non-gravitational side. And it's proposed to uh, lead to a sort of cutoff ADS like here in a picture, and I will represent that with this, uh, uh, with this symbol here. Um, so let's, let's say a very lightning discussion, let's give a very lightly, a lightning introduction to this um, uh, operator. It goes back at least to Zamolajikov in 2004, who observed that under very mild assumptions in a non-gravitational theory, in a quantum field theory, um, it's possible to take um, two stress tensor operators, take a particular contraction of them and send the points at which they are evaluated uh, to be uh, on top of each other and get a, uh, get a well-defined operator. So in this particular limit, one can extract from this a well-defined operator. And one can compute expectation values, for example, of this operator in the, in the field theory. Um, but then an additional step was, so the existence of this operator uh, was that it was proven in 2004. But then an additional step was taken in 2016 um, by using this particular operator as a deformation uh, by adding it to the action, by adding an integral to the action. So a little bit more precise, that means that uh, we'll consider families of actions parameterized by this parameter lambda here, so that at every value of lambda, uh, the, essentially the derivative uh, in field space is given by the, or the derivative of the action with respect to lambda is given by this particular um, operator. Uh, and I, you know, it's a TT bar operator really in two dimensional uh, quantum field theories. Uh, it's the determinant of T. Um, <clears throat> this is a non, this is a non, uh, sorry, this is an irrelevant deformation. So it's not quite what we're used to in the Wilsonian picture of, uh, this is a schematic, uh, let's say artist impression of, uh, of let's say the, the Wilsonian picture where uh, we can get Q quantum field theories by taking, starting with the UV CFT and adding a re regular deformation to the format to break the scale invariance and, and, and get a quantum field theory. Uh, and you know, as we all know, the, the, our G flow sort of goes down, the, uh, down this way, but for the TT bar operator, the idea is that this will send us off in a different direction of field space. Uh, and in fact, uh, in, a ir in an irrelevant direction. So we can expect drastic things in the UV drastic changes in the UV. Uh, but this is an interesting uh, thing to explore. And, in, and the reason it is interesting is because even though it's irrelevant, we can still solve certain um, aspects of this theory. Uh, in particular, uh, people have calculate, calculated observables like the S matrix or the energy spectrum when you put these theories on a finite uh, spatial volume, so a, a, um, a circle times time, for example. And people have calculated partition functions, et cetera. Uh, for this particular talk, I, I will only be able to talk about, or for this particular introduction, I'll, I'll highlight, because this will be relevant later, the energy spectrum. This is a formula that you might have seen, that you've definitely seen if you uh, saw any talk about the TT bar deformation before. Um, and it presents for you the energy levels in the deformed theory as a function of a lambda, the deformation parameter, and the undeformed energy and momentum. So this is on a, on a finite space. In fact, the momentum is undeformed, and in, in particular, it's, it's also quantized um, um, because of the finite volume. So this, uh, this equation is valid in, in, in general quantum field theories. Um, we'll be considering conformal field theories. So there we can say a little bit more, for example, um, the fact that the, uh, the states in conformal field theories are generated by, well, there are primary operators, but then uh, from those primary operators, descendants can be calculated. Uh, for example, let's take um, um, the vacuum uh, on the, the vacuum state on the cylinder. If you look carefully here, uh, you recognize minus C over uh, 12, um, that, which is the expectation value, the energy uh, of the vacuum. And then on top of that, there are uh, states that can be uh, labeled by left moving and right moving um, descendants. Uh, operators acting on this state. And it gives the following picture, which you might have also seen, and about which we can say um, uh, many things, um, but uh, I'll, I'll try to keep it short here. Um, the, the reason I show this picture is because, well, the reason I show this formula is because it will become relevant with, to the relation with uh, three dimensional anti disciplinary gravity. Um, one more remark here um, is that this. 
um, well, one more uh, remark here is that this is sort of a, a reversible flow, or basically we can we can solve this thing in, in two ways. We can start from here and go back, or we can come uh, back down. Uh, and that's sort of, uh, that will be related with uh, property of uh, no local degrees of freedom and, and three-dimensional gravity. Um, all right. So let's, um, let's go to this relation. Uh, this is mostly based on this paper of uh, Berlin and collaborators in 2016. I'll try to uh, argue for it in my own works a little bit about uh, for, for this relation. By considering the BTZ geometries, uh, which were already mentioned in uh, one of the previous talks. Um, these are the black hole geometries that exist in, uh, in, uh, in three-dimensional gravity or in three-dimensional gravity with the negative cosmological constant. Um, and they have a particular horizon. I've tried to uh, draw it here. So this is a conformal diagram uh, of the space. And I've written here the line element in perhaps a somewhat unconventional, unconventional way. Uh, I've not used the normal radial um, coordinate, instead I've used this coordinate rho, uh, which is a Pfefferman-Graham coordinate. It goes to zero here at the boundary. In fact, it might be, uh, you might be more used to the uh, notation where rho is equals the square of z, the square of uh, um, another Pfefferman-Graham coordinate. Uh, but you can see that this uh, geometry is characterized by two parameters, really, the mass and the angular momentum. Uh, why? So, so the, the relation with the uh, TT bar deformation uh, comes about as follows. Let's consider, um, this is what the authors did, one of the things they did. Let's consider not the full space, but let's draw this orange cylinder here around uh, the black hole state, some, some state with a particular, you know, some, some energy eigenstate really. Uh, and let's calculate the uh, energy contained in this uh, orange uh, cylinder. You can do this by you know, um, calculating essentially the quasi-local energy using formulas going back to the work of Brown and others uh, in the early 90s. And the result of this calculation is as follows. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it obviously looks uh, very similar to the equation of the previous slide. And in fact, it is if you identify the right things. Obviously, we identify the mass with the uh, energy in the, in the field theory. We'll identify the angular momentum in the bulk with the momentum along the cylinder. And we use this, um, uh, this well-known ADS3 CFT2 um, identi identity between the uh, central charge in the conformal field theory and the Newton's constant in the gravity that was found by Brown and Eno. Um, and in particular, the deformation parameter lambda of the, of the, um, of the TT bar deformation is related to this particular combination of uh, the Newton constant and the, the Pfefferman grain coordinate at the, at the cutoff surface here, or in terms of the central charge, this is the relation. And you can see, for example, um, if we take the radius of this um, cylinder here to infinity, rho, go, rho c will go to zero and indeed we find the undeformed, uh, we find the undeformed uh, theory again. Um, something that will be relevant later here is that um, if we take the large central charge limit uh, and we keep rho c fixed, that means that essentially lambda will go to zero. Um, so there will be some non-trivial uh, limits that we can take. Um, one way of interpret or looking at this, at least from my point of view, uh, is uh, is the following. So so I should say so this this match between the energies is not the only uh, match one can one can do. Uh, these authors went through a number of uh, arguments. Um, but one way what we can look at this is if we look at large C, uh, in fact, the, there's, a, there's a small parameter, one over C, and we can do a semi-classical uh, consideration of this system. And uh, in, in fact, you can do a variational principle. And what you see or what you can derive, and maybe what's not too surprising if you're familiar with holography, uh, and if you observe that TT bar as an operator is really uh, in the language of large C is a double trace operator, is that um, one way of interpreting the effect of the TT bar uh, operator is that it, in, it actually mixes the uh, boundary conditions that one imposes at infinity. 
So these, this is really at bro equals zero. And instead of identifying the CFT metric with the asymptotic uh, ADS metric, uh, there will actually be some mixture of the metric and the stress tensor, um, which we have to identify. And lo and behold, it turns out that if we have no matter presence, so if we are in pure gravity, then this prescription and this prescription are actually equivalent. Um, and that, the, that basically comes about by the fact that this part, for, for all um, solutions to the classical equations of motion, this particular combination at infinity uh, must always equal the metric on this orange cylinder here, the induced, induced metric on the orange cylinder here. So that's one way of arguing for, uh, for this uh, proposal, um, but only in pure gravity. Uh, in fact, uh, I should maybe mention also other work by Krauss and collaborators who calculated the uh, gravitational action on this annulus and found that it indeed corresponds to the angel value of the, the TT bar um, action. Um, so this gives us uh, the fact that this TT bar is, is, seems to be a well-defined operator in the CFT, gives us a big motivation for considering this particular, these particular um, configurations in pure gravity. Um, so that will be the objective of, of, the, of the piece of research that we did, or the objective of the talk, uh, will be to consider uh, pure three-dimensional gravity, and we'll try to impose uh, boundary conditions on a finite boundary, uh, Dirichlet boundary conditions on a finite boundary. Um, so I'll denote this here. So, so the asymptotic boundary is now in dotted line. It won't actually be part of our space anymore. We'll really consider the space um, of <clears throat> uh, geometries that have a, a particular, uh, you know, that end on a particular finite boundary. So with a finite, for example, diameter. Um, and some uh, maybe disclaimers or um, some, some caveats is that we will not actually consider the full path integral. We will, will not attempt to, to calculate the full path integral as it's clear from the talks this morning that it's a formidable thing to do and it's not known even asymptotically if we take rho c to zero. Uh, instead, we will uh, take some simplifications. For example, we will, in, in first instance, only consider spaces of a certain topology. So we won't be summing over topologies. Um, so the topology will be, for example, a disk times the time here. And as we'll go through in a bit more detail later, uh, we'll, we'll try to learn some lessons from the asymptotic ADS3 case um, in the sense that we will uh, we'll, um, will not consider all possible states, but will actually consider the states uh, that can be obtained by reparameterizations of the boundary. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll go through this in a bit more detail, but these are the caveats or the, the, the limitations. Um, so that's our objective and our strategy will be the following. Our main tools will be, our main tool will be uh, what's called the covariant phase-based formalism, um, which is a generic uh, or which is a systematic way of taking a particular action that's defined on a, on a space with a boundary, for example, and deriving from it what are, uh, what's the phase space and what is the symplectic form, for example. Um, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll find also what are the gauge symmetries. This will also automatically give us what the gauge symmetries are, what the large gauge symmetries are, which is an unfortunate name for the symmetries that are not gauge symmetries. Um, and we'll find the Poisson bracket algebra classically of, of the observables that we construct. And then in the second step, uh, We'll go through the lessons that we learn in asymptotically ADS3. We'll uh, restrict to uh, states that can be obtained by reparameterizations. We'll see that the symplectic form becomes um, something that's just a boundary term, so something that's really living on this blue cylinder here. And we'll try to formulate the, uh, the canonical quantization of the system, at least in perturbation theory. Um, and this will. Uh, bear resemblance to uh, a method that's known in the literature as canonical, uh, the, the co-adjoint orbit compensation, uh, but it will actually be slightly different. Um, that concludes my introduction, so this might be a good time to ask for questions. If there are none, um, let's, uh, let's put our feet back on the, on the ground and start with something that everybody has definitely seen. Um, which is uh, a face face. Um, here is again an artist impression. This is the um, a rendering of the face space of the pendulum, the classical pendulum, which can oscillate around its minimum or can 
um, rotates uh, uh, rotates multiple cycles. And and uh, what I try to this is the way what I'm doing now is ad advertising the covariant phase space formalism the way it's usually advertised, uh, which is the following, which is that we all know canonical quantization or or the Hamiltonian formalism of of classical mechanics, uh, but step zero in the Hamiltonian formalism is always uh, singling out a time direction and saying that the momentum is the time derivative of the coordinate, um, which is which works well, but in some theories, like for example in in general relativity or gravitational theories, we are very uh, used to uh, leveraging the space-time symmetries or the, the diffeomorphism symmetries and um, taking covariant uh, or considering covariant uh, uh, observables, etc. So is there a way to um, unite, so to delete these bars and actually have both, uh, have our cake and eat it too, have both of these aspects um, within the theory? And that, that, that's sort of how uh, covariant phase space is usually uh, promoted. Uh, it actually has a very rich history. Um, I'm citing some references here, especially the old ones. Um, so this thing has been discovered and rediscovered. Um, there, this is a very incomplete list. Maybe I should have stuck to my intentions earlier of not making incomplete lists. Uh, I hope no one uh, here has uh, <laughs> I've omitted. Um, but there's a very long list of these things. But what we will use it for is not just this, uh, you know, this nice property, but it will just be a systematic way for us to, to calculate the, the phase space and the symplectic um, form, et cetera. So what's the observation? How do we get rid of this step zero of identifying time and saying that momentum is the, um, momentum is the uh, time derivative of the coordinate? Uh, the observation is that we don't necessarily need to consider the phase space as the space of coordinates versus momentum, it's really the space of, we can really consider it as the space of solutions to the classical equations of motion. And we can label that with any arbit, uh, abstract arbitrary parameter. Uh, I've used a, a finite number here, but in, in general, there, in field theory, for example, there can be an infinite number. And the uh, position and momentum of a particular particle at a certain time is only one such uh, Choice of coordinates. It's not. It's not unique. Uh, it can be convenient, but it's definitely not unique. Uh, on top of that, this particular space always needs to be um, uh, needs to have a uh, symplectic form, which is a closed and non-degenerate two-form, which we can use if we invert it. We can use to calculate Poisson brackets of functions on the phase space um, in this way. Uh, was there a question? No. Okay. Um, so this is all uh, hopefully very familiar. How do we get this structure? Uh, let me uh, describe um, using the words of Harlow and Wu mostly, um, who wrote a nice paper summarizing many of these old results and adding some new ones in 2019. Um, and I'll, I'll be illustrating it with sort of the, the situation we will try to consider later on, which is that of a manifold um, that's a cylinder, for example, with some, so, some boundary, some finite boundary. So our theory will be, uh, we'll, we'll start from an action, which is a bulk integral over a Lagrangian plus a boundary integral over a boundary Lagrangian. And as we do, we will take the variation of it and we'll integrate by parts to get the equations of motion times the variations of the field. And then all the boundary terms that we've used to integrate by parts, uh, they'll end up in this uh, field theta here. And it will also be the variation of the boundary Lagrangian. And now we declare that the solutions to the classical equation, well, that the, the, the pre-phase space or the phase space, uh, well, really the pre-phase space is the set of fields that is in our particular configuration space, all of the configurations that we're considering, that solve the equations of motion. So for which the equations of motion are zero. And then there's a consistency condition, which is actually a consistency condition on the set of not the phase space, but the full configuration space that we're considering is that this particular theta plus the variation of L on the boundary has to give zero. And this essentially means that the solutions to the equations of motion are also the fields that extremize the action. From this, now we can identify the so-called pre-symplectic structure, which is essentially, uh, which will be very close to the symplectic structure. And it's just, uh, 
the delta of this theta. So now here, what, what we're doing is we're uh, interpreting not just these deltas as variations, but we'll now interpret the deltas as, um, ex as uh, differentials on phase space, on the, on, the on the face, on the space of all of these phi's that solve the equations of motion. So this will be a two form and it will be integrated over some hypersurface in the, in the space sigma here. Um, of the, the delta of theta. Uh, and this, so you can work out some examples, actually, if you're interested in this, you should probably do that. For example, you'll see that this just gives, uh, in, in particle mechanics, this just gives what you expect it to give, namely PDQ, and then the delta of that gives you the symplectic form. Now there's an important question. Um, this this uh, symplectic structure, if this is to be the symplectic structure, it has to be closed, that you can actually prove, but it also has to be non-degenerate. And this is where gauge symmetries come in. If this thing is not non-degenerate, there must be directions in the, in the phase space that uh, when you contract them onto the two form here, the symplectic, pre symplectic two form gives zero. And we declare that those are the gauge symmetries and they in general form a group. Um, and we'll see this in a more, uh, a more concrete example later. Um, and then to get from the pre phase space and the pre symplectic structure to the phase space and the symplectic structure, we essentially have to go through a procedure of modeling out these gauge transformations or this gauge group. So that's, that's really the recipe. And let's now look at, um, uh, let's now look at uh, how this works, for example, uh, in, um, in general relativity. Maybe I should make one more remark is that um, we haven't really we haven't really talked about, for example, well poseness of the initial value uh, problem, and we'll we'll be quite agnostic to that here. So we'll sort of assume and we'll actually apply this only to systems that where this works out, where we have a set of non-trivial solutions in the phase space. Um, so let's do this for general relativity. Uh, the action uh, is well known. It's just the Ricci scalar minus two lambda, the cosmological constant, and there's a boundary term which is the extrinsic curvature. Kappa here is uh, 8 pi times the Newton's constant. And we do the variation as usual. We find the Einstein equations and we find for theta this particular uh, form of, you know, uh, that, that's linear in the variations or in uh, the differential of the, the, the metric. Um, and you can actually compute also what the, the, the delta of the extra the curvature is. And you'll find that this is a well posed problem. If we assume or if we impose, that if we essentially fix the metric at the boundary. This is actually slightly too strong. Uh, we're, we're fixing all of the components of the metric here. Uh, you can do better, but this is actually, um, this is actually a nice simplification and will be sufficient for our purposes. Uh, the third step is then to uh, write the pre symplectic structure. And there are some explicit formula you can write down, but um, what I want to focus on is that this particular pre symplectic structure um, is actually um, actually has the following property. If you contract it with any diffeomorphism, so this is a spacetime diffeomorphism labeled by this vector psi here, and um, with the constraint that uh, this diffeomorphism actually keeps us within the configuration space, and that constraint can be written as follows. It's, this is the variation of the metric uh, along this diffeomorphism. It has to be zero by the boundary conditions we impose. And if you contract um, the symplectic, the pre-symplectic form with the vector in phase space, I'll explain this a bit more in the, in the next slide, the vector in phase space, the direction in phase space that we're going by through this diffeomorphism, this actually turns into a boundary term. So this is not just a derivative, a, a differential in field space, it's also a differential on phase space. So the delta is on field space, the D is on phase space. And so this becomes only supported on the boundary of sigma. Um, and it's in general the differential of some charge that's only supported on the boundary of, uh, of sigma. And that, that's essentially encoding for us the fact that diffeomorphisms that vanish on the boundary, so that are only supported in the bulk, uh, are gauge symmetries. Um, and it also tells us that diffeomorphisms that don't vanish on the boundary are uh, not gauge symmetries, meaning that they are really uh, mapping us providing a non-trivial mapping on the phase space between inequivalent states. Um, furthermore, um, 
this Q here is, uh, will be a conserved charge that corresponds to a symmetry if and only if psi is also a killing vector on the boundary. So notice that this um, here, I've taken covariant derivatives in the full space and not just boundary covariant derivatives. So that's not necessarily uh, the same. Um, nevertheless, we'll be interested in all of, even in not killing vectors because we're, the, the goal we're trying to uh, pursue here is to uh, find not just the symmetries, but all of the phase space. Uh, of this of this system, uh, which will be uh, conveniently labeled by these charges. Uh, so, so uh, oh yeah, let me let me uh, put this caveat here, uh, which we'll come back to obviously later. Otherwise, I wouldn't have put it there. Um, is that we are assuming here that this uh, this diffeomorphism vector is constant on the phase space. So it doesn't, in particular, it doesn't depend on the the fields which is the case as we will see for asymptotically ADS, but which will not be the case for the, the cutoff ADS versions. Um, and then, you know, modding out following the covariant phase space uh, um, scheme, we we arrive finally, as was worked out by Jankovic and Witten in 87, at a closed and non-degenerate uh, symplectic form, which they have explicit expressions for. Uh, okay, so that might have been uh, a little bit more, a little bit less extract than um, uh, than before, but we'll we'll make this even more concrete when we go to asymptotic ADS. Um, let me first say a word about these vector fields here, vector fields on the phase space, which are not vector fields on space time. Uh, in our abstract notation of a couple slides ago, uh, they'll be they'll th these are. Uh, QI derivatives, where the QI are the labels of the that label the phase space. Here, really, that will, will become the metric. And uh, so, so what these things are are infinitesimal, infinitesimal motions in phase space. And one of them is what we've been considering already: the diffeomorphisms. So, take a spacetime vector. This will induce an action or a vector in the uh, phase space as follow, but uh, as follows. This is essentially the same equation as this. But just in continuous coordinates, and we can uh, we can uh, we we all know sort of what covariant tensors are in general relativity. But from this point of view, the statement is that the Lie derivative of a covariant tensor in the phase space is the same as the Lie derivative or coincides with the Lie derivative in spacetime. And using Cartan's magic formula, we can write this as, as follows. Um, it'll this is. Uh, uh, one thing we will use uh, very often uh, is that associated to these vectors are uh, fields on phase space. Uh, and this is essentially the generalization of, a, of the Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian is a field on phase space and it will generate uh, time translations, which is a particular uh, vector. Uh, and it's, it's in such a way that the very or the exterior derivative of this function is the same as the contraction of the vector with the uh, with the symplectic form, or said another way, if I take any other function on phase space, the leave derivative of this function uh, with respect to this vector can be calculated as a Poisson bracket. That's the inverse of this equation. And we'll use this equation uh, very often, uh, noting this particular caveat, which we will revisit, revisit later. Uh, finally, I want to just say a quick word on the algebra of, uh, of, of these vectors. So imagine that these uh, vectors satisfy some Lie algebra with some structure constant. And this is the case, for example, if the spacetime vectors satisfy particular Lie algebra. Then you can, using, uh, using this relation and using the Jacobi identity, derive that the charges must also satisfy a certain Lie algebra up to a central extension, because the, the central extension will, will vanish in the Jacobi identity or in this Poisson bracket. Um, Good. So uh, we're going through all the details here for the known case uh, in order to generalize it later uh, in the unknown case. Uh, so as promised, uh, the final sort of known example that we'll talk about is that of asymptotically ADS with a flat boundary metric. And uh, the most general um, solution to this problem is was categorized by Banyanas. And it's the following. It's the following metric, which you might recognize because I wrote the BTZ metrics earlier in this form. Um, and these states are labeled by two functions, which are functions of the um, light cone coordinates. Uh, I have to say, though, that I've switched. Uh, so the BTC metrics were in Lorentzian signature, but all the rest here is in Euclidean signature. So there will be like 
holomorphic and anti-holomorphic functions. <clears throat> um, so the boundaries, so, so these functions, actually what they label is a stress tensor. So the, the TWW and WW bar components of the, of the stress tensor. Um, now it's known what the asymptotic killing vectors are, or th these are what I called earlier the uh, boundary preserving killing vectors. So the, the vectors that uh, move us in the space, uh, in, the, in, the, in the phase space or within the configuration space. And they are just uh, uh, three vectors. So the components are, I'll write them here, w, w bar and rho. And they're again parameterized by a holomorphic and an anti-holomorphic function up to higher orders in row. Um, and if we use the, uh, we, we can find the charges here, uh, they'll just be uh, contractions of the stress tensor with these killing vectors. And using this particular master equation that we had on the uh, previous slide, uh, you can derive from this that, in, that these charges satisfy a Virazora plus Virazora algebra. This is of course a very well-known result. It was derived by Brown and Hanno in um, 86. And, um, in hindsight, is, a, is a, something that's very closely related to ADS CFT already. Um, in principle, we could also write down the symplectic form, but actually, uh, the, to get a really nice form, let's do the following trick. Um, let's look at uh, these. Let's look at these states here that are essentially labeled by their stress tensor. And in a two-dimensional CFT, uh, we know how the stress tensor transforms. Let's, let's start with the expectation or classical value in, in global ADS. So this would be the vacuum. Uh, there's no minus sign due to the conventions that we're using here, uh, which are those of uh, Polchinski, uh, Polchinski's book. Uh, if we do a finite uh, diffeomorphism on the boundary now, so just within the conformal field theory, we know how the stress sensor transforms, and in particular, you can recognize here the Schwarzschild uh, derivative of this function f. Um, and uh, it's actually in terms of this particular function f. So this is sort of a relabeling of the degrees of freedom, a relabeling of these stress tensors, or a relabeling of the states. Uh, we can actually extract what the symplectic form is, and it looks particularly simple. Uh, and this is uh, it's come to be known as the Alexei Alexeyev-Shatashvili symplectic form, uh, which is just this particular combination of derivatives of uh, f and their uh, complex conjugates. So there's an analogous uh, f bar for the tw bar w bar component. Um, and if we restrict to the states that can be obtained in such a way. Uh, in technical terms, this is what's called a single co-adjoint orbit of the Vera Zorro uh, group. Then we can just label this restricted phase space by these functions f and f bar. And since we know that there are charges associated to the uh, the, the vectors, the, the space-time vectors that are that are labeled by this f and f bar, um, there's a one-to-one -one map between the two. Um, very good. Okay, so with all of this background now, we have the tools at our disposal to tackle, uh, at least classically already, the, most, the more complicated problem, which is that of um, cutoff ADS or ADS with a, or let's say, a 3D gravity with a negative cosmological constant and a finite boundary, the size of which is uh, what we will parameterize with this row C here. And just like in asymptotically ADS, the classical solutions are known. They become a little bit more complicated. This is the this is the analogous uh, line element. Um, and I've indicated in blue here, I hope this is visible for um, on, on your screen. I've indicated in blue, hopefully this helps the terms that are new with respect to the rho c equals zero um, case. Um, so we can just go through the same program as before. We can calculate, uh, or we, we know what the stress sensor is in the, in the field theory that corresponds to this metric. Um, and it's similar, but deformed. Uh, in particular, now the, the trace of the stress sensor, which is this TWW bar component, will no longer vanish, uh, but it will satisfy some uh, quadratic equation, uh, which is a trace relation, which is very well known from, from the TT bar uh, deformation as well. Um, and here comes the tricky part. Uh, we now want to classify, the next step in our program is to classify which, one, which are the boundary-preserving uh, diffeomorphisms or the boundary-preserving vector fields. 
we can again write them uh, well i've labeled them with epsilon and epsilon bar before uh, i've changed notation here just a little bit fw and fw bar which are the degrees of freedom and there will be some expansion around the slice row equals row c which for which delta row here is zero but the tricky part is here uh, that these functions now are no longer just functions of w and w bar Instead, they satisfy this modified differential equation on the boundary. And this is very significant because we will use these functions uh, to label the charges, for example. And uh, let's imagine that we, uh, that we, we will focus on one particular diffeomorphism uh, with some values of f and f bar at, some, at the fixed time t0. In the undeformed case, this blue term isn't there. And if we go to a different time, there is a, a very trivial relation between the uh, between how we label the charges at time t zero and at time uh, let's say t zero plus delta t, and the the relation is essentially just given by a phase because these things are well or the relation is essentially given by uh, just shifting the uh, function to the left uh, with a phi that's exactly equal to delta t. In particular, um, it doesn't depend on which background solution we're evaluating this charge on. Uh, it will be the same. But now, if we, because of this additional term that's imposed on us by a conservation of the metric at the boundary, at the finite boundary, uh, you see that there is these uh, parameters, curly L and curly L bar, which, which parameterize the state. So this will be the essential, uh, one of the essential difficulties that we'll have to deal with in this, uh, and that we'll have to generalize the formalism with. Um, so, we will be very careful from now on to on, on how we label the diffeomorphisms. We will select a time equal time slice t zero, and uh, specify the values of these functions at this time slice. Um, in particular, uh, this very useful formula that we talked about before will no longer be valid in general uh, because there will be uh, you know these um, there will be the, the vector field psi here. Will be non-trivial functions on the phase space. So if we take differentials of uh, of this uh, form, uh, there will be differentials hitting the size, and this will so this in general will no longer be true. It will only be true at this particular distinguished time slice, uh, and also in particular uh, so for the algebra of asymptotic or the algebra of boundary preserving vectors will no longer be reflected in the algebra of field space. And so this breaks down as well. Um, Okay. Nevertheless, we can uh, move forward and try to calculate the charge algebra. So the algebra of these Qs here. Um, step one, because the charges are constructed from integrating the stress tensor over the boundary, we need to know how the stress tensor uh, transforms. And we can extract that from, because we know how the metric transforms and we know how the metric trans depends on the stress tensor. And if we do this calculation, we get the following result, which looks maybe quite messy. But uh, ignoring the terms in blue, you will just recognize the, the, the essentially the lead derivative fw times dw of l, and then this, this factor two here uh, corresponds to the fact that the stress tensor is a spin two field. Um, and then there's this um, term here uh, that's proportional to f rho, and um, I've forgotten to write down what f rho is. It's essentially the w derivative of uh, fw plus the w bar derivative of fw bar. Uh, with some factors. In fact, it's exactly this factor here at the front. Um, so if you uh, ignore the, the blue terms, this will give you a third derivative, which you will recognize from the Dura de Rol, um, algebra. So using how the stress center transforms, uh, we can now compute how the charges transform, and we'll label these charges at uh, the time slice t equal to zero with the exponentials, uh, the left moving and right moving exponentials. But notice that these this will only be true at this particular time slice. So this is sort of, uh, this is uh, you know, normal terminology, but it's not strictly true. And we find using at t equals t zero, the, the master formula, the Poisson bracket is given by a var variation. We find the following uh, Poisson bracket for the charges. And again, you can recognize sort of the Viva Zorro. This will become more explicit in a, in a second. Um, but now there, is a no there are nonlinear, uh, it's a nonlinear extension of that, which depend on, on rho c. Um, so, this is, uh, so this is valid for generic, uh, 
states, but we can expand it, for example, around empty ADS, and we can do the following expansion. Uh, we can essentially take the background value. Okay, sorry, let me explain here. Um, so our deformation parameter rho c goes to zero for the undeformed case. Alpha is a particular combination of it, and it goes to one uh, in the undeformed case. So here you can see sort of the background value minus c over 24 uh, plus um, some coefficients times exponentials. And from this uh, Poisson bracket, we can now derive a Poisson bracket for the Ls and L bars, and it looks as follows. Uh, and, and here it becomes very explicit. Uh, the form of Vera Zorro here becomes very explicit. So if we set alpha to one and rho c to zero, uh, then this is a Vera Zorro algebra. But now we'll find a, a general deformed version of this. And we're, uh, in fact, it'll, it'll be, uh, this is written as an expansion in one over c and it'll go on. There will be many terms here. Um, and notice again, also uh, in relation to the remark I made before, um, so we're keeping rho c fixed and we're sending c to infinity. So this will actually, from the TT bar point of view, this means that the deformation parameter will go to zero, almost uh, zero. Okay. Um, that was sort of step one uh, of, the, the, uh, of what we did in asymptotically ADS. The second step was to restrict, was to use this, uh, these co-adjoint orbits. Um, but that begs, that becomes a, a difficult problem now because we don't really know what the finite diffeomorphisms are that preserve the metric unbounded. So we, up so far, uh, we've worked with infinitesimal diffeomorphisms, and in asymptotically ADS three, it's uh, it's trivial to extend these because they, they just become holomorphic functions uh, still on the on the boundary. Um, but this becomes a much harder problem. Uh, and this is where, where things might get a bit messy, um, because in order to solve this, we uh, introduce the perturbation theory uh, in uh, as follows. We say that we do a finite um, diffeomorphism on the boundary. We send phi to phi prime plus some field that depends on phi prime. And this is again at the t equals t zero time slice. Uh, we send time to a certain new time parameter and we send the ADS, uh, the, the radial coordinate to a new radial coordinate. With these dots have uh, contain higher powers of t minus t zero and rho minus rho c, all of which are determined, or you can determine uh, algebraically in terms of these functions a and b. So the degrees of freedom here will be a and b, um, and so the, the, these functions, the higher order terms, can be determined in terms of them by requiring that the metric on the boundary remains unchanged. Um, and then we can use, uh, we can find the uh, symplectic form um, similarly to, to how we found it before by using this master formula again, and this will be the result. And this is as an expansion in powers of A and B. So this is up to um, third order in A and B. In fact, in the paper, we included an additional order. So this starts looking uh, pretty messy. So this is, uh, this is the, the analog of PDQ in classical mechanics. Um, but as is also as we're also used to, we can do uh, canonical transformations to simplify this thing. This is not particularly enlightening, maybe essentially because we're only working up to a few orders in perturbation theory. But the key message that I want to bring is that we can simplify this um, considerably by going to tilted variables, and then actually um, for the quantization, it will be uh, useful to go to these a particular linear combination of them in which we can write the symplectic form as follows. And so this is just a quadratic term, a quadratic, um, quadratic in the Cs and the Ds, and it's just a boundary contribution as expected. So this is on the, the, on the finite boundary. Um, okay, very good. Um, also, mm, you can see that, uh, well, actually, so for, for asymptotically ADS, uh, there were some zero modes, essentially the constant, uh, value for C and, uh, and D will be zero, but also E to the I phi and E to the minus I phi, the things that correspond to L minus one, L zero and L one will actually be, uh, will, will be gauge degrees of freedom here. It's only the higher values that will um, be uh, non-trivial transformations. Uh, so here is a summary slide. Um, so we found this particular symplectic form and in particular, and we've also found uh, what the momentum is in these variables. This is actually undeformed, as one might expect, and the Hamiltonian becomes some, uh, some, some uh, non-trivial function that we know in perturbation theory. 
Um, and these dots here are up to higher terms uh, that we, uh, in, in principle, we can do this up to higher terms and find a more general um, field redefinition and we'll get more terms here as well. Okay, as a final step then, uh, now we are ready to uh, try to canonically quantize this, this theory. And um, we do this as follows. Uh, first of all, this quadratic symplectic form um, to get rid, well, essentially it's, in, it's incorporating these, this, these primes here. We can get rid of it and put it in the Arbu form by introducing the following basis of, for, for C and D uh, with coefficients C, N, uh, and some normalization factor here, which is goes like one over the square root of C. And quant quantizing this theory canonically now amounts to, or at least this, uh, this was the, the first thing you would try and it seems to work out uh, by promoting these coefficients to operators saying that they have a certain permission conjugate and that acting on a vacuum state, the operators with positive N, so N greater than one in our case, because uh, n equals zero, one, and minus one uh, don't appear. That these uh, operators annihilate the vacuum. The symplectic form can be written in this form. And so these are the commutation relations. We can write the momentum operator just the way it was, just the way you expect, it's undeformed. And you can also get an expression for the Hamiltonian. Uh, this Hamiltonian is, has the zeroth order piece here, or well, this is linear in C. Then there's a piece that is just essentially a free theory uh, just to, this, these are number operators at order c to the zero. Then there's a piece at order one over square root of c, which essentially will turn out to be completely irrelevant. And in principle, but we have yet to do this calculation, you can go on. The reason I say that this order one over square root of c uh, contribution is irrelevant is because it can actually be rotated away by a unitary rotation. Uh, so we have only, so let's call this h naught, h2 and h3. H3 can be rotated away. And this is good because if we want to compare this to the TT bar uh, spectrum, we can expand the square root in the TT bar spectrum and there was no order one over C, um, sorry, this should be an order one over C. Um, there was no order one over square root of C contribution. And that's exactly what we find. We find sort of the, the zeroth order and the free field contribution in the CFT to this. Um, that's what we, you know, could find rigorously. We can actually, we actually in the paper we have a bit of speculation um, to how the next orders will go by looking at um, by constructing some ladder operators that are not exactly ladder operators, but that are ladder operators up to the appropriate order in one over c, and we can um, argue that under certain assumptions, actually the next term in one over c will be exactly the one that we expect from expanding the TT bar spectrum. Um, up to this order. Um, and the prediction, if, if you know, from the prediction we would have from, from the TD bar theory would be the following is that uh, inverting the relation. So the relation has a square root, but it can be massaged so that uh, it becomes a quadratic. So, so that the uh, Hamiltonian appears here with linear and, and quadratic terms, that this will just be the undeformed Hamiltonian. So that's, that's a prediction which. Uh, if it's true that 3D gravity with a particular cutoff in the setup um, agrees with the, th uh, the TT bar spectrum, then this would be the prediction. Um, so let me conclude. I'm almost out of time. Um, so this is very briefly what we did. We tried to uh, sit down and follow our noses uh, within classical three pure 3D gravity uh, with a finite boundary, find their observables and their algebra, um, and uh, initiate a quantization of the quote unquote co-adjoint orbit, even though it's, uh, it's a bit more tricky than that, um, uh, of this particular uh, phase space. And we found agreement up to the order that we worked uh, with, uh, up to the order that we worked to with the TT bar energy spectrum. And so uh, there's some, some outlook, a very obvious one is to go higher order in one over C. But after that, it would be very interesting to see if we can use this to calculate correlation functions or to do this on different backgrounds and in different situations. Um, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for that really excellent talk. Um, uh, if people want to, uh, I can see people already uh, 
clapping uh, virtually if people want to unmute themselves and do that as well. Uh, let's thank Ruben. Uh, questions, discussion. Feel free to just unmute yourself and jump in with the question if you have one. I have a quick question about uh, possible generalizations to uh, higher dimensions. So of course there are attempts to generalize TT bar to higher dimensions, but a lot of your other techniques here seem uh, pretty specific to the low dimensional case you're in. What do you think might be extendable? Uh, yeah, exactly. Sorry, I can't really see you because I'm sharing my screen, but um, uh, yeah, I, I would agree with that. So we've used a lot of techniques that are very specific to the case uh, of, of three-dimensional gravity. And it's sort of, um, it's hard to see, you know, you would have to go back to almost the very beginning to, to really extend this to higher dimensions um, and, and, and start solving uh, the problems almost at the very beginning. And I would say for me, intuitively, the fact that in higher dimensions you have um, local degrees of freedom. And if you uh, want to restrict to a finite cylinder, you might actually be tracing out part of the Hilbert space. That's sort of the, uh, at least intuitively, uh, the, the, the most um, the, 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 the most significant obstacle that you'll encounter. So unfortunately, I can't really say much, but, uh, um, uh, but beyond what's already been done in the literature, I think, uh, yeah, it's, it's hard to generalize this particular uh, approach to higher dimensions. And you think that that difficulty is mostly on the side of the techniques that you're using to uh, calculate what you're getting on the gravity side? Um, I'm not sure. Yeah. So, so essentially, so the covariant phase space approach will still work and it will still give you a, a good answer essentially because uh, of what Chernkovic and Witten did, but to, to get the simple form of the symplectic form, let me see if I can find it in the slides, uh, the simple form of the symplectic, well, yeah, like this one, that's only supported on the boundary. Um, you, we've used that the states can really be parameterized by doing these boundary diffeomorphisms. Uh, and this is true in a two-dimensional CFT, but it might not give something non-trivial in, in higher dimensions. Um, okay. it, might not, it might give you a very tiny slice of the phase space. Right, I see. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, any other questions? What about doing the same thing, but uh, for lower dimensions? If, if you want it for JT gravity or something like that, you expect to get something non-trivial and interesting. Yeah, and that's an interesting question. I, I don't I don't know, uh, but it it should in principle be technic in principle be technically um, easier. You should say though that so then we would be considering JT gravity, for example, right? Yeah. Um, I uh, yeah I, I I don't know. I think it would uh, you could probably do it, and um, I'm not sure if with respect to the literature. Uh, you know, so, so you see, people were already able to, to make a, a lot of progress there and calculate full path integrals. Um, so I'm not sure if you know there's there's anything new we can say in that in that regard. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it works at least. Right, I agree. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Any other questions or thoughts? I have another question, but I can wait a bit, uh, see if, if other people want to talk to. I, I would just go for it. And, uh, okay, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead. Um, so I think I, I have a bit of a trouble seeing where uh, alternate boundary conditions would come in. So I'm thinking here along the lines of something like the Comparison and Strominger boundary conditions, uh, which are supposed to give us a you know a duality to something other than just a CFT. Is there room to incorporate that setup in your formalism? Um, so so I think so. There's two things. Uh, so so the mixed boundary conditions that we talked about uh, that I mentioned in the introduction. Um, they're not really so so they're they're sort of 
continuous deformation away from Dirichlet boundary conditions. They're not really as far away as going all the way to Neumann boundary conditions, for example. That would correspond to just taking exactly the, the stress tensor with no coefficient of the metric here. And I, in, in particular cases, uh, there exists indeed a duality between the, the theories that are given with Neumann boundary conditions and the one uh, with, with Dirichlet boundary conditions, as you know. Um, I don't, I'm not sure if this, if there's a, if there's a duality here uh, that, that would hold for every value of lambda, for every value of the deformation. Uh, that seems like a stronger statement. Um, nevertheless, at the level of uh, deriving this sort of, a, a, you know, at the semi-classical level, you can still, this is essentially the same. Um, the one difference in principle is that now the deforming operator is an irrelevant deformation, but you know, because it's such a special one, you, you can actually get away with this. Okay, I, I see. I'll have to think about it a little bit more. Right. I'm also happy to uh, talk later, maybe in the gather uh, or so. Other questions? So don't uh, don't be shy to continue, as uh, Ruben just said. Uh, uh, Ruben and maybe some of the other speakers will actually be in the gather space, and so you can uh, uh, ask them further questions there, or just chat with whoever you find there. I'm putting into the chat a reminder of how to get there. Uh, that should be in the chat now, including the password and the link. And remember that you have to use uh, Chrome. And uh, hopefully see you there. So in the spirit of what would happen if this were a physical conference, this would be where we'd have a final break before you grab your uh, swag bags with all the fancy conference uh, pencils and things that we gave you. And you'd be getting on the bus to the tour of the local pyramids or other awesome structure. So we can just pretend we're still doing that. Um, and so see you on the tour bus. But before that, let's chat a bit more for uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, the space will be open till three, if not, if not later. So feel free to just chat with whoever you find there and uh, grab some people uh, and bring them in. Let me also take the opportunity as the last formal speaker to thank, uh, to thank you, Clifford, for organizing this wonderful meeting. Uh, it was a pleasure. It was the first one uh, for me, but I hope uh, not the, not the last one, uh, and hopefully also the only one that's virtual. Um, but thanks for organizing in these difficult circumstances. Well, thanks everyone, uh, uh, all, all the speakers and the participants uh, and all, everyone involved in keeping this, uh, this, this, this alive, which I think is uh, of value to the, the local neighborhood and beyond. So uh, let me also uh, mention that other, other things have started up. Uh, so Cindy, for example, can tell you about the Southwest Strings meeting and uh, other things like that. So um, uh, keep an eye out for these things and support them because I think uh, uh, as we've learned in the last year, local, local is important. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's keep supporting that. Uh, okay, so uh, see you in the break space and I'll leave the Zoom open just in case uh, people want to talk here too, and uh, uh, see you next time.